Welcome to uh, this deep dive. And this time we're going to be exploring something uh, pretty fascinating. I think the Apollo navigation systems, you know, the systems that guided those missions all the way to the moon and back. It's hard to imagine the challenge yeah. of traveling 238,000 miles, you know, yeah. the, the, the unforgiving environment of space. Absolutely. <laughs> Landing with absolute precision. It's just mind blowing. And then having to find your way back home. Yeah. You know, it, we often think about just these huge Saturn V rockets blasting off yeah. and heading towards the moon. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more to it than just pointing and shooting, right? Absolutely. It wasn't as simple as that. Right. The Apollo missions relied on um, a remarkable interplay of human decision making mm -hmm. and these automated systems of very delicate balance that made those lunar voyages possible. Yeah. It's this fascinating blend of human skill and cutting edge computing power. Exactly. And at the heart of it all was the primary guidance navigation and control system, the PGNCS, or better known as the PINGS. Yeah, the PINGS. The PINGS. So this system was crucial for making those real-time decisions right. and adjustments, right? especially when the spacecraft was behind the moon, you right. know, out of contact with Earth. You're on your own. Totally on your own. In those moments, the astronauts relied entirely on the PINGS to stay on course. The PING system consisted of three key components. The inertial measurement unit, okay. the Apollo guidance computer, yeah. and optical instruments. Got it. So the inertial measurement unit, or the IMU, was constantly tracking changes in velocity and position, kind of like a spacecraft's inner ear. Like the spacecraft could feel where it was. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah. It's this internal system that's keeping tabs on everything. So the IMU relied on gyroscopes to stability and accelerometers to measure those changes in velocity. Exactly. This is what we call inertial navigation. And it was vital because it allowed the spacecraft to figure out its position without needing external references like stars or radio signals from Earth. It's a self-contained navigation system, which is crucial when you're out in the vast emptiness of space. Right. However, the IMU's accuracy wasn't perfect. Over time, its readings would drift slightly. Think of it like a compass that slowly loses its calibration. So it needs to be reset. Exactly. Every so often. That's where realignment came in. Right. Astronauts would use star sightings and data from tracking stations back on Earth to recalibrate the IMU, ensuring its continued accuracy. So they're double checking it, making sure it's all good. Precisely. But all that data needed to be processed. Of course. And that's where the Apollo guidance computer, the AGC, comes in. The AGC was a marvel of engineering for its time. It was a 16-bit computer built with silicon-based integrated circuits. 16-bit, that's it. That was groundbreaking back in the 1960s. I can imagine. It had the power to perform real-time calculations processing data from the IMU and optical instruments. Wow. Determining the spacecraft's trajectory. Right. And even controlling the propulsion system for course corrections. So it was doing a lot. And all of this was being operated by the astronauts. So a simple interface called the DSKY. DSKY stands for display and keyboard. Display and keyboard. So just a screen and a keyboard, essentially. That's it. So to kind of put all of this in perspective, if the IMU was like the spacecraft's inner ear, sensing its movements, the AGC was the brain yes. interpreting those sensations and making decisions based on them. Without the AGC's ability to process information and make those real-time course corrections, a trip to the moon and back would have been impossible. It's absolutely crucial. Absolutely. So we've talked about this internal system, this internal guidance, but I think it's worth looking at how they use the stars for navigation as well. Yes, celestial navigation played a vital role in the Apollo missions. It was like a crucial cross-check for the IMU's readings. So we'll dive into that next time. Absolutely. Sounds good. Think of it like the early sailors navigating vast oceans using the stars, you know. Right. The Apollo astronauts used a similar principle, measuring angles between celestial bodies to Different. verify their position in space. So they were double-checking what the pings were telling them. Exactly. It was an independent way to confirm their location. It wasn't just a matter of looking out the window and saying, oh, there's that right. star. No, it was much more precise than that. They were using some pretty sophisticated tools. Oh, yeah. They had specialized instruments to make these precise measurements. So in the command module, they had the sextant for measuring angles between stars. Right. And the scanning telescope to actually locate those stars. Exactly. And then the lunar module had its own tool called the Alignment Optical Telescope, or the AOT for short. The AOT helped determine the lunar module's orientation. But all these instruments were essential for celestial navigation. They were, but their effectiveness really hinged on something else. What's that? 
precise alignment with the IMU. Okay. And that's where the navigation base comes in. The navigation base. Yes. It acted as a rigid framework connecting those optical devices and the radar to the IMU. So it kept everything lined up properly. Exactly. Everything stayed perfectly aligned thanks to the navigation base. So why was that alignment so crucial for navigation? Well, imagine you're trying to aim a rifle. Okay. Even the slightest misalignment at the start can make you miss the target by miles. Right. Because over that distance, a tiny error gets magnified. Exactly. And in space, the distances are so vast Jeez. that even tiny misalignments could mean missing the moon entirely. That's a big miss. It could jeopardize the entire mission. Uh, yeah. The navigation base was there to eliminate that risk. So it was all about minimizing those errors. It was the skeletal system that kept all those sensitive instruments in perfect harmony. It's just remarkable the level of precision involved in all of this. It is. It really speaks to how carefully every aspect of the Apollo missions had to be planned and executed. Absolutely no detail was too small. And speaking of careful planning, we have to talk about the backup systems. Ah, yes. Redundancy was absolutely paramount for the safety of those astronauts. Right. Because if something goes wrong, you need a plan B. It really showcases NASA's commitment to defense in depth. Every critical system had a backup, ensuring that a single failure wouldn't spell disaster for the mission. So, for example, the lunar module had the Abort Guidance System, or AGS. The AGS was a simplified backup navigation system that could be used to abort the landing and return to lunar orbit if the primary system malfunctioned. So that was like the emergency escape plan. Exactly. It was there to get the astronauts back to safety if anything went wrong during the descent. And it wasn't just about having these automated backups. Right. The astronauts themselves could take manual control of the spacecraft in certain situations. They were highly trained to handle those contingencies. They had the Stabilization and Control System, or SCS, for that. The SCS allowed for manual control, which sometimes proved to be essential. Like when Neil Armstrong had to take manual control during the Apollo 11 landing? Exactly. He had to avoid a boulder field and ensure a safe touchdown. So in that moment, human skill and intuition really saved the day. It shows that even in the age of advanced technology, the human element is still crucial. Absolutely. We've touched on how the astronauts interacted with the navigation system through that DSKY interface. Right, that display and keyboard. But I think it's worth delving a bit deeper into the world of the AGC's software. The software behind it all. Yeah, the invisible force that was guiding these complex systems. The brains of the operation. It's easy to overlook the software, but it was just as crucial as all that hardware we've been talking about. Let's unpack that further then. Yeah. The AGC software was really something else, especially when you consider how little memory it had, just 72 KB. That's tiny. I know, to think that was enough to guide a spacecraft to the moon and back, it's remarkable. It really is. You know, the average smartphone today has millions of times more memory than that. It's mind-boggling how much they achieved with such limited resources. It really speaks to the ingenuity of the engineers and programmers back then. They had to be incredibly efficient with every single line of code. Oh, absolutely. They had to squeeze every ounce of functionality out of that limited memory. And they did it using something called rope memory. Rope memory. Yeah, it was a unique way of storing the code. So how did that work? Well, the code was physically woven into the computer's memory using wires and magnetic cores. Wires and magnetic cores. So it was like physically hardwired. Exactly. Picture wires threaded through these tiny donut-shaped magnets. Wow, it's so different from the microchips and flash storage we're used to today. It's a completely different world. And this software written in assembly language was essentially the invisible navigator. It was working behind the scenes, constantly processing data from the IMU and those optical instruments. And don't forget, Performing those complex trajectory calculations. Right, and controlling the spacecraft's propulsion system to make those course corrections. It was a lot of responsibility for a relatively simple computer. And it wasn't just a static set of instructions oh, either. No, it had to be adaptable, able to handle unexpected situations and respond to the data coming in. It's like it had to think on its feet. In a way it did, the software had to be able to adjust to whatever the mission threw at it. Which meant the engineers who wrote the code had to have a deep understanding of orbital mechanics, celestial navigation. Right, and all the complexities of how those spacecraft systems work together. It really highlights how important human expertise still was, even in the age of computers. Absolutely. Those engineers and, of course, the astronauts who were interpreting the data and making critical decisions, they were all vital parts of the equation. It was a true team effort. And that's a key takeaway from all of this. You know, 
the Apollo navigation wasn't just about the hardware or the software, it was about that seamless integration of human ingenuity and technological innovation. It was about bringing all those elements together. Exactly. The ping system, the AGC, the optical instruments, oh. the backup systems, all working in harmony. Guided by those highly trained astronauts. The Apollo missions represent this incredible high point in human achievement. You really do. It's a testament to what we can achieve when we set our sights on something that seems impossible. And the legacy of those missions, it reaches far beyond space travel. Oh, absolutely. The principles of redundancy, cross-verification, and system integration that were developed for Apollo. They're used everywhere now. Everywhere from aviation to medicine to energy, you name it. So the next time you look up at the moon, yes. it's more than just a celestial body. It's a symbol of human ambition our ingenuity, and this incredible drive to push the boundaries of what we think is possible. And this deep dive into Apollo's navigation systems, it's shown us that those systems were more than just tools. They were a testament to human innovation and that determination to succeed. It's inspiring. It really is. As we continue to explore our universe, yeah. the lessons learned from Apollo, they continue to guide us, inspiring us to reach for the stars and push the boundaries of human exploration even further.